All right, today we have Susie Neville. We just spoke for about an hour and a half. We spoke a lot about anatomy. We spoke a lot about stuff we learned from her, me and Callan doing her mentorship. And she's just such an epic person. How good was that podcast, dude? Yeah, one of the best mentors out there. Physio, check practitioner. She's a... Uh She's she's gold. She's gold. Mm. So we spoke about the SI joint. We spoke about what else? We, I don't know. It's one of those things. We spoke. She's about She's good lot. looking too. But if, so. yeah, just 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 listen to it. If you're into the body, listen to it for sure. Yeah, very much. If you're into, it was very much a heavy like into the body podcast. But fuck, it was good. And if you want to learn some shit and um, sign up to her mentor stuff, it's it's going to be epic. hear the intro music everybody welcome back to the corrective culture podcast (laughs) we can hear these dope ass beats in our headphones but you can't it's so funny we never we always thought people were listening eh? we always thought people could hear it and we're like yeah like like, like, (laughs) we're just sitting there quiet in front of them (laughs) (laughs) welcome to the podcast welcome 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 it's been it's been a minute it's probably been like a year has it yeah since like the last potty yeah maybe yeah maybe longer Yeah. yeah Um, and, and we didn't get the video in last time, so now we got your beautiful face on camera. Yeah, now we can create some reels and do all the good shit that we like to do. Yeah. Mm. So uh, for people listening, we have Susie Neville on. Susie Neville's one of our mentors, mm. the 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 queen of the Czech education, <laughs> the yeah. uh, physio and 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 Czech practitioner, and and all all the things, and helped us like helped us heaps. so much like. We did mentorships with her, me and Callum both. And uh, yeah, like I owe all my shoulder knowledge that I've learned pretty yeah. much to you and, and yeah. also the book that you showed me. So, and plus a bunch of other shit. But yeah, yeah. it's fucking been amazing to, it's been an amazing journey knowing you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's, it's, it's what it's all about, eh? Yeah, fully. Yeah. yeah. And learning from the best. We did a, what did we, was it our own potty we did ages ago? And we'll, we, I'm not sure if you heard it, but we're talking about what we took from yeah. our mentors <laughs> and, and, just doing Zooms with you empowered me the most because it was more so the concept of thinking that way, of thinking what, what, you, what you gave us was anatomy in the sense of at least starting anatomy of like, all right, well, now you can start learning about this and, and thinking about what that would do to the joint and the fibers that it crosses and then how you can then look at someone and see, almost come up with a custom plan that's always custom to that person's posture. And I think that is so empowering. And I think that's also what we didn't get. That was one of the missing links in the Czech education because obviously there's so much they can show us, right? But that was a missing link for me because a lot of the time it was like, why is this person having this exercise? And and, Mm. and like there was all these different, same when we did like scientific back and core, there was a heap of exercises at the end of it, but you didn't know what they were for. Yeah. So it's like, and then you did scientific shoulder and I watched that years ago. And um and that was when we first saw like oh this is where the shoulder should be you know and 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 now what you know so mm. um yeah so thank you <laughs> yeah thank you Gracias. oh you're so welcome I love that I've been included in your group because I I love what you're bringing to one your community and the Czech community and you're showing I guess because I'm a little bit just a little bit older than you <laughs> <laughs> but I'm a, you know I'm another kind of generation and I feel like. You've brought a bit more fun into the game as well and you've shown us how you can work and it doesn't have to all be like r- really serious and really like stuck yeah. in, the, in the assessment and you really add a really nice life to it that I've really enjoyed being part of actually. It's been yeah. great. Cheers. Yeah, that's thanks that's cool. That's cool. Yeah, I've never looked at it like that but that's sick. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I, I can honestly say from from everyone I've worked with, you've helped me the most. In um, Me too, yeah. Yeah, just – yeah, again, just that concept. It's, and, and it's so rare, isn't that? And where did you learn that from? Actually, let's go into that, Susie. Where did you learn that from? Because you wouldn't have been taught that in uni. And and what well, did it come from just self education? I know you've I've got you you've done a lot of the Czech stuff in the base, but but thinking about the insertion origins and and thinking about how they would act on the joint and then coming up with plans around that. Where did you learn that from? Uh so I was a terrible student. I did really badly at school. I um, was lucky to probably pass, and it was when I ultimately, like like understanding anatomy and physiology, I remember 
all I did with anatomy was just wrote learn it. Like I'm just like, I've got to just learn it off the heart. I'd write it out and write it out and write it out until I learned it. And then I would with physiology, I just feel like drowning. Right? I don't get it. And then I started working. And it was when I started working that I worked with the great physio who just made me think that way. But also when as soon as you're with a client. Um, and things aren't working, you have to think differently and you have to kind of learn to visualize what the tissue's doing so that you can understand how, if you affect it, what it will do to the joint. And um, so being out there and doing it was the biggest learning curve for me. And, you know, going and working at the Czech Institute, I was super lucky. I got a good job with Paul and I would watch him all the time. And, um, and that was how I, best learned what was the best thing to do but at the same time you have to get out there yourself and actually do it I used to just do a lot of study every weekend I was at a new course and I never kind of had a social life because I was just going to new seminars every weekend and um and you can only learn so much and then ultimately it doesn't it just doesn't make any difference anymore if you haven't actually put into practice and I I think that's the one thing that tech practitioners uh, a little bit naughty with sometimes is they just keep wanting to learn. And I get that. Mm. I totally get it. I was that person. Um, but if you don't then practice what you've learned, you don't learn to apply it and it's applying, it's applicating and visualizing and being with someone and seeing how they react that that's where you, uh, you can actually influence what you and take what you've learned and make it work. Yeah. Yeah. It's so true. Like I remember uh, after IMS to, years back i look back at my programs from ims2 and i was fucking shocking eh? like like mm-hmm. i was giving people like seven things i remember just giving people way too much shit and and then looking back at my own life and thinking man i can't do more than four of these myself so i personally stopped giving people more than like four x ex- like corrective exercises because i personally had an ethic ethics of myself because like i just know i don't do more than that it's like yeah. it's not even like the time thing it's the mental attached to the exercise that you're giving them because because when, like, especially in similar to you, like the way I instruct, it's like I get so into it and the details of it and then they and then they understand it in some sense and they get so into it and they get inspired and they're thinking about it too. And it's fatiguing. Like doing a horse dance, mm. it's fucking when your brain's thinking about it, where's my hip, where's my spine, where's my head? <laughs> like, yeah, like, and I, I think that's a gap too, eh? Like I've been working with a client lately and I was just like there's, there's so much and I really want to it's, – it's hard to do that in 10 sessions, right? with someone like, especially with all the Atlas stuff and stuff, stuff I'm passionate about now, it's like I want to work with someone for almost like, I've just signed up a chick for a, for a year. And I'm just like, I'm going to work, with, I'm going to work with you for free for a year because I want to cover everything. I want to do the the neck. I want to do, do the eyes. I want to do the jaw. I want to do everything. This is just for, for me personally, but I'm trying mm. to figure out a way where, yeah, you can get people in for that long time because like Callan, like when you're with a client, like you could teach horse dance for an hour and a half, like with some people like it takes a long time yeah and so like being so street i I spent i spent about half an hour on horse dance today yeah right and and when you work with someone susie like because there's you can start right from the top of the totem pole you can start from the atlas and whatnot do you is when you see someone are you just are you going by the book are you just pulling out assessments where you feel necessary at this stage you know if I am not sure about what I should be doing, I go by the book. Right. Okay. So I had a couple, I had two, oh, three new people yesterday that really kicked my butt. Um, and they were all very difficult. And um, I saw one of them again today because she'd come from out of town. And I realized that really I had not followed by the book. And when I came to do her follow up today, I just didn't have enough information. But she was a very specific injury that needed to have rehab before I could literally go into the cheat protocol. And so I didn't follow her by the book. I just um, actually addressed her just part of the assessment. The other thing about the assessments is that they are so long that people don't often have that time. And I had an hour and a half with her yesterday, and that wasn't enough to finish it. So I got her in back in today and did a little bit more and slowly over time I will follow I have followed it by the book. Yeah. But yeah. I, I didn't exactly then and today I did uh, you know lots of amazing scar tissue work on her and um you know started her on her exercises, all uh 
only related to the assessments that I had done. And, um, you know, I find too that every exercise is a test. So what it does is it tells you about that person's ability. And uh, I use that as an assessment, even if I'm starting to give people exercises. The problem when someone comes to you from out of town is that you don't have a whole lot of time with them. And mm. uh, teaching this stuff's quite hard online. It is possible. Mm. Uh, but I had to give her something to go with. And today was our last session. And again, it was only an hour. So Right up from the start with her, I said to her, look, we're compromised on time here. You're not going to get everything you want, but we'll get you started. And um, I truly believe with tech practitioners who are struggling to do it all, I'm like, do parts of it and become an expert in that and then move to the next part. And, and when you do a part of your assessment, just learn to interpret just those results and what would you put in a program for just those results. Then – move to another set of assessments and put them together with what you were previously and now are expert at, but you were pre- previously doing, and start expanding how do you interpret now the bigger battery of results. Mm, I think like, Sometimes sorry. when people get out of the courses and they just like, fuck, I've got all this information. <laughs> sorry. And they've got all this information and they are like, oh, I've got to do it all, and they never actually get an assessment done properly because they're afraid of it. Yeah, I think um, like going through IMS2 with you, getting our heads around, like even me and Cal, I think, went down that second time, eh? Like we've we've done almost IMS2 a couple of times and um, I needed that. And then I also needed the mentoring with you with IMS3 because I after IMS3, I kind of forgot all the tests and all the pivot shift tests and all the knee ACL um, draw tests and things like that. But now after doing the mentoring with you and now I can understand why when I would do that. But I hadn't yes. had the – I didn't even have the IMS – didn't really understand everything in the IMS2 stuff first. So yeah. that's what I mean. Like we had to do it twice to understand it. But then when we move forward, so like I, what you said then was just so spot on. I feel like you just got to try and master the little stuff. Then yeah. The stuff – and that is like uh, – Alex Rubchensky the other day said the best course he's ever done is IMS1 because you get to learn all scientific back and scientific core. And I was like, do I really understand that? And I was like – yeah, I do, but I'd like to like learn the hydraulic amplifier system and really understand it. So I went back and learnt it. So I feel like yeah. that's that's powerful, and that's what that's how you just keep growing, eh? And then it makes more sense for the whole everything else. Like, mm. I just mentored someone today that is an, who did IMS three with me in in the states in September, and um, we started back at IMS one today, and we, yeah, and and we were starting back with that and assessment of IMS1 and program design and interpretation. And um, we're going to structure and work through each level. So it's almost like he's doing it again, but he's doing it just like, you know, much more one-on-one and, and mm, it was great. That's sick. Yeah. Jealous. And also <laughs> I, I'm, I did I'm, what was IMS1 back then. I did it seven times. Wow. Wow, well, yeah. A, yeah, that'd be awesome. That's That'd be awesome. Yeah, that's sick, hey. Um, Oh, for a personal question, like when, because what uh, I didn't, what I've integrated now into my work that obviously I didn't at the start was, was like tissue work. And I see you do a lot of hands on and, and mm. tissue work with people and, and not just the stretching. And what's your thoughts on that? Like, if say, like, would you go straight into s- stretching someone and this, and their tissue could be dry? Is it, is, are they going to get a, a, a response or the same response compared to like, whether you do hands on or whether they foam rolled or whatever hydrating from a fascial perspective and then stretching. What like can you comment on that? Yeah, I don't often start with stretching. In fact, I will start with strengthening even before stretching in right. some cases. Yeah. Um, again, that depends on people's um hypermobility. So massage can destabilize people, stretching can destabilize people if they're weak and if they're hypermobile, like if their ligaments are quite lax, mm-hmm. they can um be destabilized by that and and muscles that are filled with knots and trigger points are not going to really stretch that well Mm -hmm. Uh, same they won't strengthen as well so uh the soft tissue is pretty much an immediate thing that i start but i will throw in the mix either strength or either um stretching depending on where they sit on that hypermobility scale and depending also on um I think some of the myofascial stretches and some of the cheek stretches, I think, can really um, pull people's 
bodies around in ways that will mess with them. Mm -hmm. And I think you have to be really careful with that. So, yeah, I like to do soft tissue work. Uh, It does mean that I have a session with my clients when they come in of soft tissue before we get started. Mm. Yeah, Uh, that's what I feel intuitively. Yeah, Yeah, fully, hey. And I've just seen a few, like, so many times where, you know, you measure it just from soft tissue work and all of a sudden you get an extra 20, 30 degrees of prone knee flexion or something like that um yeah. before before the stretch and um oh. but in saying that if i could just add yeah. um um oh gosh it was, fuck it's just gone out of my head <laughs> i love it <laughs> i had something really i was good i was gonna say it'll come back don't okay. worry yeah because i wonder is it a fascial restriction i got rid of or is it just tone coming out of the muscle from the pain from from the, the foam roller or whatnot and it's just taking the tone out um to get yeah, oh, that, that, that's what I was going to say. Sorry to oh, interrupt. Right. Um, if people don't, if people just want to get tissue work and they don't exercise, mm. literally, you're going to whatever gains you make will never hold. Yeah, it's never ever an isolated thing. And the clients mm. of mine that come in and just want tissue work, it's a problem. Mm-hmm. I'm like, we're not going to make any gains. You, you're just going to be coming in and paying me money and then leaving and coming back and paying. Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a cool. Uh, I was thinking about with Corey, one of one of our mates who you you worked with while you were here. He was telling you about how his his adductor was always tight and he was always stretching it, always stretching it, and and how it was always tightening up. And then you gave him strengthening exercise for it. We like, oh well, that's not working, so let's strengthen it. And then he's now he came in the sauna that was like a month ago. He's like, yeah, it's completely freed up now. Like I strengthened it and the tightness is gone. Right. So how do you? tell when something's short and tight or short and weak you know what i mean like how do you tell like that may show up as an abduction limitation but it could just be weak and are you do you are you pairing things constantly with strength tests as well or yeah well strength being stronger will always drive better mobility uh and i think that dominantly people are short and weak because mm, um, strength gives length, and- eh? Yeah, the short and tight comes from the faulty loading where you're constantly working in a position that where a muscle will rob the work off the other muscles. Um, and that can be a tip, that can be a true short tight muscle. Opposite to that, you've got probably short but weak muscles where they're hanging on for dear life because they're weak. So they're hanging on. Mm. Um, and so how do I determine that? Well, my assessment helps me determine that. And, and knowing that muscles work reciprocally, where one is on and the other is off, and we're trying to get co-contraction around a joint to make it stable, then um, you can sometimes make a determinant as to, uh, let's say, the quadriceps. Let's say they stand in an anterior pelvic tilt, and um, it's because they're quad dominant and their glutes have not worked for ages. But you test their hamstrings and their hamstrings also look really tight. But you know that that anterior pelvic tilt is probably, you know, created from a quad dominance and led to more quad dominance and the hamstrings will be like going, oh, we don't have to do anything because the quad's doing everything. So, um, but then the brain's going, oh, the pelvis is unstable. It's anteriorly tilted. It's not in a position where it's it's holding. It's good close pack position of the joint. It's loose. And the brain says, okay, I've got to try to stabilize that pelvis, so let's get the hemis to do it. So now the hemis are hanging on and the quads are hanging on, and you're like, oh, they're both tight. We've got to stretch them both. And so you have to work out how do I know what to do. Sometimes I don't know what to do, and sometimes I just have to deal with addressing one thing. So I'll always err on the side of going towards stream. But if we do some strength work and that opposite muscle does well, that muscle doesn't change then I will change my focus around. So I do an element of maybe two or three weeks of trying one approach, and if it doesn't change, then I will go back and change the approach out and add a stretch. Like Chick believes that if you don't bring down the tone in that short, tight muscle, like that quad dominant muscle, if you don't bring down the tone, you're, it will always rob the work of the hamstring. So um, you should stretch that out before you do your exercise program. Mm-hmm. And this is a controlled, tempo-based exercise program. It's not an explosive sport. You don't want to do any sort of stretching before that, which I know you guys have talked about mm-hmm. on your your um, posts. But um, 
that's the one time where you do need to decide to do a stretch beforehand. And sometimes I find that out because we're doing squats or lunges and they've got knee pain. And I'm like, okay, let's just sedate your quad a little bit. We'll stretch it right now between the sets. And let's come back to that set and see what happens to the pain. And, and quite often you can influence and change that pain. So therefore you know, yeah, that's a short tight muscle. Mm. And, and you can determine. It's, it's a tricky question you ask, Helen. It, mm. it's, it's always a bit of trial and error. Yeah, and, and when you've been around long enough, you can see how they're presenting as to what might actually be happening. Um, and if the core is shut down, you, you're going to know that, the, again, the pelvis is unstable and so the hamstrings will be tightening up in a taut but still weak way mm. to hold that pelvis. The hamstrings are not meant to hold you all day. You, your hamstrings are meant to move you and explode you. Right. They don't, they're not meant to do two jobs. Yeah. Right. Are they more phasic dominant? Are they? Yeah. There's a predominance of that. Yeah. Every muscle has both, yeah. you know, like fast twitch and slow twitch, and it's just a, what is more dominant. And there are fibers that can also modify and change their function based on the loading. Mm. So mm. the core, is the core the like predominant kind of thing that keeps the, the pelvis steady through through um, the day? Like just have or, or optimal co-contraction through the tonic fibers of the um, – the hamstrings and the quads like is it yeah, I, th- I think it's all i think you yeah. to stabilize the joints you need co-contraction but the core is a really big factor as is multifidus as mm. is posterior fibers of the internal oblique mm. as is some of the pelvic floor and and therefore some of the hamstring can help with that but it's resting tone and a good strong hamstring that will help as opposed to a hamstring that's taut and working because it has to because the body's under threat do the, mm. do the obliques have some? I'm trying to think about it. Have a, have a posterior tilt action at all with them? Yes, they do. Is yes. that the external oblique? External oblique, definitely, and some of some of the fibers of um, internal oblique, and also rectus abdominis. Right, mm. right. Because you know how sometimes I think I've just spoke about this once. Like I've, I've noticed that when my core draws in a little bit, which I'm sure I'm getting oblique with that too. There's a, a little few degrees of posterior tilt that naturally happen in in my pelvis. Um, okay. and, and I'm thinking, okay, is, what is that? Like it can't be the transverse abdominis. So I didn't feel like I was flexing. So it's like, but every time I draw a core in and I'll see my pelvis posteriorly just moves a little bit and it, and it feels good. It feels like it in a good way, you know? Um, but I was wondering, okay, is that maybe the external obliques? And, and I don't know. It, it yeah. may be, and it may be that they're a little bit um, over-facilitated. Right, okay, yeah. Maybe. Yeah, and and you know, if there's one thing that I've really done a lot more of lately, it's getting my hands into the anterior oblique, uh, anterior abdominal wall as massage, because it's it's amazing to me how little work is done on that area and how yeah. much how much muscle is there, mm. and if you don't clear out um, and clean out obliques because they're you know they're, they're phasic and they will produce lactic acid. It can really add to a lot of people's problems especially onset of pain towards the end of the day. You know, if you haven't got the support from the deep abdominal wall and your obliques are doing all the work, then they're not meant to do that all day. They're not going to last. And so they're going to start creating lactic acid and you're going to start getting problems and you're going to start getting a dominance and a rotation, especially if there's a facilitation on one side. Yeah. Um, that's, so it's very common. That's so cool. And, and touching on that, that last course I did, we went more into that into the listening techniques of that ribs with the Diane stuff. And I'm starting to feel it more, which is cool. Like I used to, I was like, what the fuck am I feeling? But now mm-hmm. I'm letting go of ribs and I'm literally feeling them move back and like, and it's some crazy shit, but I've, I've found the common pattern and this is what we saw in class as the most common and anything that attaches to the ribs can move the ribs, basically what she's saying. But the common one is uh, external oblique and, and tracking the fascicle to the rib. So you can find the rib that's sticking out Tra- trace it to the edge, find that external oblique fascicle, it's like tender, and and it that'll rotate the rib to the it'll, it'll pull it towards the external oblique, so it shifts the rib out one side and rotates it to the opposite from the external oblique. So yep. like you're talking about there, and this is what I mean though. This is where I sometimes get like, all right, we're getting that precise, but if you balance that whole abdominal wall, sort of get in there anyway, mm. then you're going to be doing the same thing without having to be. So precise at that one rib sort of thing. Um, Absolutely. 
Yeah. So, and I think another thing that um, really which attaches at the ribs is your thoracic erector spinae and um, how they run. They're more muscular up on the ribs, but they run as tendons right to your sacrum and to your ilium and can literally influence the sacroiliac dysfunction. And everyone's looking and treating the glutes and the obliques around there and nobody's looking further up at what the those paraspinals on the ribs mm. are doing to the um, sacrum, especially if the rotation's up top and it just tracks down into the uh, sacrum and the ilium on that on that side. Wow. So that's, yeah, it's another area I think that uh, we're kind of not we're not connecting enough. Yeah, yeah. So what were you like – go and clean out like literally like sort of that multifidus tissue like right on either side of uh, are you getting all of it right but right on the side of the spinous process so you sort of go and slightly i'm slightly more lateral i'm slightly more on longissimus and iliocostalis okay in that area and um then and, and multifidus always i'm cleaning out because it's it's a deep stabilizer so if that's facilitated and it's 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 just superficial fibers are working then you're getting more a bowing of your uh, lordosis rather than a, a stiffening or a compression. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, I want to always clean out multifidus. It's my go-to. But then mm. when I think there's an ili- uh, a sacroiliac issue, I'll also go up into those those ribs where the uh, thoracic iliocostalis and longissimus are. Right. Well, yeah, okay. That's really cool. Um, and are you, when you're assessing the SI joint, are you just doing the IMS3 stuff? Uh, yes, yes, yeah. I am. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm doing a little bit extra that I've learned at some other schooling. Mm-hmm. Um, but if I think about what I learned at physio school and my postgrad, it, it's what you learn in IMS3. Yeah. Oh, right. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, cause I, I thought like they say it doesn't move, right? Isn't that the, the, the standard of like a fresh physio coming out of uni <laughs> today? They're pretty well saying nothing can happen to the SI joint, right? Wait, the SI joint moves? No, <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. Okay. I've cut myself in so much trouble here. So I went to, <laughs> I did a lot of study with uh, this French osteopath, Guy Boyer, and um, he, I said that, and I didn't believe it. I know that the SI joint moves. Mm. And and from the readings of Nikolai Bogdu, a clinical anatomy of the lumbar spine and sacrum, he, he talks about it being two to three degrees, um, but it's the it's how it moves in this really oblique, and horizontal and mm. vertical axes. And I get to this course uh, with all these people in Dallas, Texas, and it was like tons of people in the room. And I say this to Guy, <laughs> what about the school lane of people that are taught that the SI joint doesn't move? And honestly, and I did study with Guy for five years, and every time I met him at a course, he would mock me. <laughs> no, it was kind. It wasn't me. Mm. But he'd take this out of me because he was like, Oh, you know, this person that thinks the SI joint doesn't move. <laughs> I got I got harassed for years and years and he he couldn't believe he couldn't believe that that's what we were being taught. Yeah. So lots of different schools of thought on it. I'm not saying yes or no to that. The the jury's still out <laughs> for mm. some people. Mm. Um but I believe there is movement based on my own ability to control that movement that I've learned over the years mm. and my own ability to feel um, the pain of it when it happens. Mm. So, yeah, I believe it most. Yeah. And do, from your experience, do you usually see the pain on the dysfunctional side? You know what I mean? No. You see it, you see it transfer across? It can be on either. So you can get a blockage or, or a, a joint that's not moving well, not gliding, and it, it creates the other side to have to move maybe a little bit too much. Right. And it gets irritated. So it gets, even if it's not too much, it just, the, the, the normal side often is the pain side because it's dealing with the the lock or the lack of movement on the other side. And um, once you get that other side moving better, that painful side starts to ease up. It can also be that you've strained or you've injured that painful side. You've had a, you know, like a slip or a, a subluxation or you've had a ligament tear um, or you've had, a, you know, the, the joint sitting in an awkward oblique position. That will also be painful. Mm. Uh, and did that happen because the other side's blocked? We don't know that. Uh, but I do typically um, get, keep an eye on that. I don't just assume that the sore side is the problem side. Okay, yeah. Got a slip? 
A slip would have to be rare, right? Because it's sort of like so, you know, like sore tooth together, isn't it? Like, yeah, so, so the older you get, the more that gets interlocked bo- in a bony way. Right. But in your youth and in your first two decades of life, the the surface where you've got this bony interlocking happening between the bones of the sacrum and the ilium, that's quite smooth when you're younger. So I think a lot of our problems happen with some of these crazy falls that we have as kids. Mm. I think about my trampoline, you know, all the crashes mm. I did, how my SI joint pain that I have every now and again now is probably based on the fact that I shifted something way back and I haven't got that moving right. It's almost like the train's slightly off the tracks. Mm-hmm. And um, so uh, I think that as I get older, that bony interlocking is getting more and more deep and it wants to sit and it's not sitting well and I'm irritating it. So it, in your eighth decade of life, like in your 80s, Sometimes the bony interlocking is so deep that the SI joint fuses. Right. And this is where some of the elderly can literally get, um, because the joint stops moving and they keep moving. And, you know, walking is rotation and walking requires your SI joint to move. Mm. Say so on ilium on both sides. And you've now got a fused joint. Well, quite often they get stress fractures along the uh, sides of the spinous processes of the sacrum. Right. Because it's not moving, so the sacrum's doing this with each step, and it gets little stress fractures in it. Wow, wow! So sometimes, some, some, and you know, and this, this is like seventies, eighties. That can be quite a common, really painful issue for them. Yeah, that's that's pretty cool. Uh, I, I like fuck SI joint. Every second girl has an SI joint issue these days. Eh? Yeah, I don't know. It's such uh, a common reckon, thing. And then um, the atlas too. Like I've. I've been seeing so many atlases out sort of since I freaking got back from that course. Like, and it's almost like like the last two girls I've had in, I, their chin's just been off to the side, like completely. Right. And I've just been like feeling, oh, you obviously there's SEMs and the scalenes are tighter on one side and stuff like that, and respiratory muscles, like you can feel them like when they breathe in and stuff like that. But do you see that always? Like, is that really common for you to see the head? Like, do you can you see an atlas out just like straight away? Like the atlas is out or do you always have to go to your tests and be like, you know, March test, uh, weight shift test? Yeah. And for the Atlas, p- people listening, Atlas oh, yeah. is, is C1. C1. We, sur- we forget that most people vertebrae. listening aren't at all. <laughs> don't even know the name of the muscle. It's, it's called Atlas because the joints are shaped like so and your skull sits on top of it. Mm, right, right. Like like what she said, what she said. Like- Atlas <laughs> holding up, up, up the world, you yeah, know, yeah. That the God who held up. The planet in his hands. Yeah, yeah. right. Um, and so your atlas is your top vertebrae that attached to your head, and and it's very mobile. So up there, because the discs are like, uh, sorry, the joints are shaped like this, they can slip inside, mm. and it's very reliant on muscles to help control. Yeah, it's it. very loose. It doesn't, it doesn't have a lot of ligaments. It's loose, and C one and C two are both loose, and then C three, the joints start to sit slightly in a way where you don't get that slipping and sliding, you get a lot more stability. So your rotation up at C12 is 50% and it's okay, five degrees yeah. per level below that. So when you um, have an issue up top at C1 and it might be rotated or it might be shifted or it might be side bent, it can have, and there's a little bit of controversy as to whether this truly happens or not, but some of the work that Paul studied and some of the osteopathic work, they believe that there are ligaments that attach the spinal cord to the body of the atlas or that where the spinal cord runs through the canal, the central right. canal, which is where the cord is running. There's ligaments that attach the spinal cord to that bone. And there's only another, there's only like two other areas in the spine where the, that area and down below where uh, the spinal cord can attach literally to bone. So when the atlas shifts, it can take your your fiber optic highway, your central Mm. nervous system, and it can shift it with it. Mm. Now, if you've got tension up top in a system and it's pulling it one way, at the bottom it will will also want to rotate it with it. Okay, so Mm. that's why as above, down below, you get – issues at C1 can present and be mirrored right down at L5 and um, and at the sacrum. So L5 and 
P1 hold hands and then your cranium and the sacrum kind of hold hands in the sense that they mirror each other in their dysfunctions. And wherever the sacrum's twisted, you've got L5 sitting on top. So if the sacrum's going like that, so will L5. So mm. it's not just girls, by the way, that get <laughs> SI joint problems. Yeah. I see a lot of males. Um, and both of them, males and females, it can be either driven from the atlas driving the sacrum, the sacroiliac or the L5 S1 junction, or it could be um, the other way around. Well, okay. Typically, this is a big control center, as is your pelvis. Yeah. But um, if it's off up here, um, it will be a stronger drive to drive it being off down low, whereas down low you don't always get an atlas that's driven from an SI joint, uh, but you can get all sorts of other joints, like feet and knees playing up with SI joint problems as ribs, as you know. Mm, yeah. And does that carry on up maybe? But, yeah, you can visually see it a lot. But if you if you look at me and you look at my earlobes, see how they're mm. sitting, mm. and people might see that I have that's like an atlas yeah. fixation, but it could just be that I've got fascial tension driving a mm. tip. True. But, no, I think. I've definitely got an atlas subluxation and my head always sits off to one side. Um, well, <laughs> and that, <laughs> has, <laughs> has Paul ever done your atlas? Yeah. Fuck, I'd love yeah. to see that. And I, I, there's a guy in, uh, in California who, if I see someone who's very, feels very like this is subluxed up top here, I, I ask them if they're ever going to California, which is tough from New Zealand. Yeah. I ask them to go and see this great nuca which is the National Upper Cervical Chiropractic Sick. Association, uh, and you could chiropractic called Kenny Shepard because I love his work, and Ooh. I used to see him a lot. Um, so, yeah, um, he's uh, he's like my go-to if things are not Sick. going well. Oh, send him my way if you get stuck now. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> um, I'm still very much learning. <laughs> it's cool, but um, like, I love it. Uh, have you ever seen any really cool like uh, client results of – you treating an atlas and seeing like a really big change that you that you remember? Oh yeah. So I remember this guy coming in and he had 32 pound weight shift, heavy oh. on one side. Oh. We just did the atlas treatment, which is an amazing muscle energy technique. It's really cool. You you don't have to you don't do an adjustment or anything. There's nothing aggressive about it. Yeah. He went right down to eight pounds. Wow. Wow. Like, okay. like immediately that he yeah. got off the table. Um and did I, it stay think- did it stay like that? Like very crooked. Uh, you know, we had to do it a few times, and I sent him to Kenny. Yeah. Because I just felt like he needed a little bit more than what I was able to do. But um, no, once you get them, once you get them aligned like that, that's when you start doing activation, muscle activation. Yeah. Yeah. And you just try to stabilize it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and quite often, when an atlas is repositioned um, and everything kind of settles into place. Uh, you may not need a whole lot of treatments. It may be one or two sessions, or maybe three sessions. Yeah, you don't well. have to keep going back again and again. Yeah, again. That, that's so cool. I had a guy that hear because you know how the hearing and, and the eyesight's very linked to it. But I had a guy with a hearing aid the other day, and he had a he had an eight kilo weight shift um, with the hearing aid in, I believe. And then I took the hearing aid out, and it was it was an eight kilo weight shift still. Did the atlas. Got it back into, I think it was in with, within three kilos, and then put the hearing aid back in, and then it went out again. <laughs> so I was oh, like, wow. yeah, so I was really, yeah, I was trying to ask Donald this the other day, but I didn't get around to it. But it was just a interesting, like, may, you know, because he can't hear out of one ear. So that hearing aid might, could alma, almost be always throwing his um, vestibular out, his balance out, or? It may not. It may yeah. just be that he's using a tilt of his head. Mm to orientate the hearing aid to hear better mm. and that therefore changes his weight shift. Mm. Mm. So it could be something vestibular, but it could just be that he, you will notice people that have a weak eye or mm. weak hearing, but they always turn to listen. They'll yeah, use their dominant sure. eye or their dominant ear. So he could be doing that. He's definitely doing that, yeah, for sure. He always turns. Because his, he, yeah. he's, he, he associates that hearing aid. With being able to hear better, hear better, so he'll turn maybe to listen. Oh, that's just I'm guessing. Yeah, it for could, sure. Have you ever got into the cranial sacral stuff, Susie? Uh, n- not as not as treatment, not mm-hmm. cranial sacral treatment. No, um, I've never learnt that. Um, but I really believe in the cranial sacral pump, the cerebrospinal fluid pump. Yeah. Remember when I used to work with Paul, he used to 
say to me to feel the tailbone as people breathe and to feel it how it moves. Mm. <laughs> he could always feel it and I couldn't even feel it. And I'm like, mm. <laughs> it's like when he asked me to put my finger near one of his plants and watch it move. <laughs> <laughs> And I can I can see it move. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, see, see. I'm like, no. <laughs> but I really believe in that craniosacral pump and its need for health, for mm. health through the whole system. I think it's super important, and and in particular with fascia, you know, fascia is not healthy. The craniosacral pump will be influenced, and also if their breathing pattern is off, you, you lose that beautiful say, craniosacral pump. And people try to get it by they get a pump by swaying. You'll see people sway like this. They're trying to stimulate the craniosacral pump because their breathing pattern is so dysfunctional that they um, they have to use it through, get a pump through movement. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Like I've, I've been touching, like that's what we did in the last course, but I, to be honest, I haven't practiced it too much. Um, but it was just like, you know, when you see, have another thing added to it, you're like, fuck, where am I going to f- – put this in you know <laughs> like yeah imagine the assessment like if you wrote down oh, everything dude. you'd have like because like, I, I remember when we were practicing on you and mm-hmm. it was it was actually pretty clear on jake's like because his temporal bone was was rotated forward on one side right right mm. and then when i rotated it back it's very subtle right and sometimes when you rotate it back you have to distract the sphenoid at the at the front because it actually jams so you got to get your finger and, and distract it like at the where the temple is push it forward so it actually has a little bit of space to rotate back. And that's only if it's, uh, what do they call it? Sort of like it'd be that similar on pattern, off pattern where if the eye is further back in the skull on one side, you can see that that's somewhat yeah. the sphenoid. And then, and, but with his, when I did it, because I could feel that his C2 was sticking out on one side, on his right side. And then when I did the distraction, I could feel it slide in. And then when I let go of it again, I could feel it slide back out. And this is, this is the stuff we're meant to play with all the dying stuff with the neck and constantly feeling yeah. and seeing how it all changes. And then you got to play them off each other and say, is C2 driving that or is that driving that? And all this sort of shit. But I was, that's why I asked you if, if you were um, into that. Cause I was like, I, fuck, where do I throw that in? <laughs> you know? Yeah. You know what I love? I love, and this is what I learned from Paul was that, do you have to know what's driving it? Mm. Don't you just want to address what gives you the results and you work with that? Like, do you have to have it all calculated out in your head? It's, oh, this is driving this, this is driving this. Let's just treat it and tr- kind of tr- treat it all. Mm, and, yeah. and I feel like you kind of have to do that. Like I think a lot of Czech practitioners get very stuck with the atlas and they don't think about really these these cranial bones and how they shift and how they can also cre- create tension through the fascia and that can pull the atlas around and all everything around. Mm. So I, I, it's great that you're learning that. I yeah. think that's Super great tool, but you're right. It's just another tool in yeah. the toolbox. You can have a very full toolbox. There's this chick mm. on TikTok at the moment. She's like Russian. She shows uh, fascial fa- – Rani showed me my sister – fascial face massages. Mm, and yes. then, and then, like, all these people are really backing it. And then Rani started doing it. And then she goes, two days later, she's like, my friend's commented on my face. Like, have you been doing something and shit? And she's like, yeah, I have been. I've been massaging my face. Mm. It's a full, like, technique for the head and the skull and whatnot. But – um. I wonder if that's the next step because I can see in my face sometimes and we will have it. I'm like, there's a fucking droop on one side and it's like, it's like <laughs> this and it's that. And it's like, I can see my eyes always like, even yeah. when you drink alcohol, one eye's lower and yeah, shit. Yeah, for like, sure, dude. And I was, I was, I fucking was looking in the mirror this morning at my ugly side, <laughs> which is the left side of my face. And I was like, my, and I was thinking about like this fucking <laughs> podcast and I was like, um, Usually this is set up and it, for some reason it, it looks at me this way so you can always see this face. I was like, I want to change the camera. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but maybe this fascia stuff, dude, mate. Yeah, maybe we can start doing full face massages because we all focus on the rest yeah. of the body but we never think well, about the face. Every morning I wake up and I always do because I don't want to look tired. <laughs> I, I always do this like, you know, that like open oh, up of the thing and true. I feel like it helps. It gives blood to the face and like. True. Is that going. zone six exercise. Yeah. Thing. yeah, yeah, just the thing. So I'm driving my car going. Feels ridiculous when you do it. Eh? Yeah, it does. But don't it be driving your car doing that. You've got to put your eyes back in your head. Yeah, you yeah know? I am. Yeah. <laughs> Why are you driving? Yeah, it's all good. Yeah. Um, I'm multitask, girls. On my phone as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Look, look. Let me know with the facial stuff because I think it'd be good for my, you know, good for my wrinkles. Too. <laughs> Mine too. Natural Botox. <laughs> yeah, it's like fuck. I reckon nothing works better than gelatin. Do you notice when you have a heap of gelatin? Do you notice it in your skin? 
<laughs> I, I, I really know. I think it. my skin passed it. <laughs> nah. <laughs> I have to try a bit more. Yeah. Oh, I really know. When I load up mm. on it, like 15 grams, it's one and a half tablespoons. When I load up on that, I really notice it like rapidly within mm. a day. Um, and I don't even think it's placebo because sometimes I've done it and forgot and the next day I've noticed mm. in the mirror, I'm like, oh, that's right. I had heaps of gelatin. Mm. So my, and Mine's coffee. Like I feel true. like uh, my skin looks dehydrated if I drink too much coffee. But even one even one double shot a day, I feel like I'm just looking in the mirror sometimes. I'm like, oh, fuck. I look tired. I need to lay off the coffee. <laughs> um, what are you learning at the moment? What's what's what are you getting? I know you were getting into the genetics and and the blood work sort of stuff. And what are you? What's what's your passion at the moment? Oh, I'm, I've shifted a wee bit back to the microbiome. Nice, hmm. nice. Yeah, and, and like kefirs <laughs> and and like you know what I mean. Uh, actually, slightly. Um, Stephen, I'm just revisiting Stephen Gundry because he's just put out a new book called The Gut Check Mm -hmm. Um, and just some of the – I'm not very far through this, by the way. Mm -hmm. I've only just started. So, um, But just really trying to do some experimenting on myself around it Um, and, um, you know, just there's this whole surge over here of everyone having oat milk and everyone thinking this is a great product. Mm -hmm. And the bottom line is that oats – no matter where you get them from, have been sprayed with glyphosate. Mm. And um, and just I think we're getting way too much exposure, which is Roundup, I guess, glyphosate. Mm, yeah. Getting a bit too much exposure, um, that's really affecting our microbiome with that. And um, so in all the neuro or neurological and neurotransmitter issues that happen when the microbiome in the gut is affected. So uh, just trying to look at boosting Echomancia. I don't even know if I'm saying it right. It's one of the bacteria with like things like pomegranate and cranberries and matcha and green tea. And yeah, okay. I'm just, I'm just trying to just try some stuff on myself. See cool. if that will help with my face massage. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, just you know, energy. Um, I'm in my mid fifties, and I just feel like I've got to do whatever I can to keep my energy up and be able to keep working out and lifting and just staying really healthy and. Um, so that's who I'm studying mostly at the moment. Um, I'm not really doing a whole lot of uh, manual therapy or physiotherapy type of study right now. I've just taken a wee back step. Unfortunately, um, Guy, who I was doing a lot of study with, is not able to get into the States much more. And so he's doing courses out of the Dominican Republic. And it's just been a little bit inaccessible for mm. me. I just have to get there. And um, and so yeah, I'm, I'm just being. At, I'm just at home doing my own sort of learning. Uh, you opened your own place again, though, as well, didn't you? Had it? You opened your own clinic again. Did I just yeah. reopen? It's so great. That's I wish awesome. I could have done this from this this recording from in there because I love the space, um, but I don't have internet, no. <laughs> and I couldn't hot spot it. But I was a little bit, yeah, yeah. A little bit about whether that would work. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I just I've had it's been two years that I've had all my stuff in storage. Well, wow, okay. Um, I just uh, needed to kind of. It feels really great to have all my gear around me again. My cable system. It's funny. My gym gear is a little bit like my wardrobe. My high heel shoes. It's like yeah. I love them. Yeah. <laughs> I've got a lovely new squat rig that's got like laser printed numbers all the way down at the hole. So it's like I, I used to put my own stickers on and number them, and now I'm like. I'm not so ghetto. So, yeah, it feels great to be doing it myself. It is a space, though, that's too small to have multiple people in. So it's just really me and my clients in it, and it's lovely and feels that's quite sick. Sick. That's nice. good. And where, where is it? Where is it located? It's literally seven minutes from my house. Okay. And it's in Greylin in Auckland. Yeah. And, um, There's a lot of New yeah. Zealand listeners, actually. A lot of people hit us up, and we just say, Susie Neville, Susie Neville. So yeah. They're probably some <laughs> of them have hit you up, yeah. Um, yeah, go see her. Yeah, definitely. If you're an NZ and you're listening to this, is, yeah. is it your if, if, she's got, just, if she's got room. Yeah. I just was going to say, I've just literally sent a text message to Ginny, who's my practice manager, going, um, I think we need to close the books for a little bit because <laughs> yeah. it's Shit. full. I'm, yeah. I'm really busy. Um, but also, um, yeah, I, I, I would love to be able to help people. It's funny you were talking about, how Jake, you're taking on that friend who you're going to work with her for a year and trial everything. I, yeah. I do a, I do a one person sort of pro bono per year. Cool. And I just met this girl yesterday and um, 
really interesting stuff going on and uh, I'm just going to be doing that same thing where I'm just going to keep her yeah. coming along and working on stuff that's in a way a little bit experimental but also she's happy to have that done and yeah it, ma- it makes it's it nice. fun yeah it, we work really like the moment because we're just shooting content we like to just we like to help people and it does feel nice when you can offer someone a couple of people of free sessions and you just get to experiment and film it and stuff like that. Like it takes the, I don't know what it is. It just takes the pressure away because you're not taking money from them. It's a full love exchange. It's like this, like takes yeah. the pressure of the result away too. Yeah. For sure. Like, oh, I'm just going to try. I know we're going to go over time. I always go over time anyway. Yeah. But um, I have to worry about someone else walking in, you know, and, yeah. and just playing with their body. Like, and what I, what I love actually is, and th- like I've I've recently well, probably last year started doing this is is doing isometrics on a muscle and seeing what it does to the body. So running so much tone into it that it's like almost burning out, and then seeing what is that doing to the body, you know. So say like someone's downly rotated shoulders, and then you get some upper trap stuff, and and then you see okay, does that change the angle? And fuck straight away, it's like was like yeah, completely. fully. But you changed it, and change. sometimes I do it, and it didn't change it at all. So I know oh let's think probably that's not it if they go do that for two weeks straight it's probably not gonna change the joint in the way i'm thinking i don't know is that a, is that a way of thinking or am i off track there Look, i'd probably just be a bit more scientific with your assessments mm-hmm. and do it each week or every two weeks and mm-hmm. actually see if if they do do it more than once is it going to make a difference mm-hmm. are you doing this because of tendon issues and you're doing isometric holds or are you just doing it just to see no i'm also you- just to see what is how does the body act when that when there's so much tone in that muscle that it feels tight for them right now? Almost like retensioning it. If it's if it's if right. it, if in my head if it's taut, I would do that. Yeah, right. You'd yeah. contract it and shorten it. Yeah, just to see, just to see, like you know, like say um, someone's got an anterior tilt, and I give them say like a like a almost like a hip extension knee flexion, but just an isometric hold, and then just yeah. seeing does that. What what does that do to their pelvis? You know, after they get up from that, does that change that? Can I definitely that? ramp up tension, which is what you want? To yeah. Um, yeah. I do think the only thing about isometrics, and it's I, I may have said it before to you guys, but it, it, that you can create some real trigger points in the muscle. Right. So you, okay. I didn't know that. You, yeah. As long as you keep um, keep the muscle healthy with some self massage or some sort of yeah uh, right massage then you, yeah, you shouldn't have any issues with it. It's just another form of creating tone. It's not that it's a negative. And I think that if you're measuring, then you, at least you're being more than just observant and saying, oh, look, it seems like it made a change. If you're yeah. measuring it, then it really did make a change. And then you want to measure, does it actually have a lasting effect? Um, and has it changed, one, their symptoms, their range of motion or, you know, their ability to move it better. Mm. Yeah, I, I just – try trying those things is great. You've got to do that. It's a really cool thing to do. But just yeah. document it so that you actually don't get people saying, oh, no, you shouldn't do that because this will happen. Yeah, right, true. And then say, well, hey, measured this. We <laughs> we documented the subjective findings. Yeah. And, yeah. What um, helped? Sorry, you go. Oh, I was I was going to say the further that we're getting into this, the more I'm really respecting that diet is mm. is uh, sometimes unquantifiable what it's going to do to their musculoskeletal system. And I've just experienced it on myself. Like probably about six months ago, I had like a lung sort of chest infection thing and I could touch the spot on my chest and it would make me cough. Like I touched that part of my lungs almost and I go, oh, cough. And I was like, oh, that's where the infection is. And it was right on my SC joint. And my SC joint, then probably the next day, became sort of unstable. Like it actually moved for a couple of days. I was like, what the fuck's that, you know? And then it just went away and so did my chest infection. It's never come back since, you know? I didn't have to do any strength or strength or nothing. But that was a that was like literally the spot that my finger was. That was a link to me thinking, oh, okay, like somehow that infection took tone out of that area and destabilized that joint from a visceral thing. There is a little muscle down there called omohyoid. And um, it actually has a slip that attaches at the lung. So if that muscle was a little bit heightened or not happy, it may have been influencing as you press and you influence the tension in that muscle. It may have also influenced the the lung because it has a slip. Attaches at the organ. Yeah, well, fuck. There you go. <laughs> a, you can think. We can think about it all, right? Yeah, fully. Eh? Yeah. What What really helped me, and especially with IMS four, Susie, was um, 
going through the assessments and writing your assessment findings. Like, I can't believe I did not learn this until I did a mental thing with you. Like IMS three, like going through all my assessments and then going, okay, I'm going to go through every single assessment I do and write down whether it was correct or not. So, okay, we had a tight right adductor. We had a, a, le- a left tight ab- abductor. You know what I mean? Like, and writing down every single thing through the assessment. And it helped me with the Atlas stuff because, you know, when you're like, right. you're doing the breathing and you're feeling the scalenes, okay, tight right scalenes. Um, head sh- uh, feels like it's out to the right. And then everything starts to paint this picture, but then you then you don't leave anything out with your client. You know what I mean? Because yeah. before that, I was kind of just going, oh, okay, I think some pine lateral bore will fix this and this and this and this. But I actually didn't have like a black and white program that I, that was addressing. And, and then you can see, you can go, okay, high priority Atlas, uh, low priority, like, I don't know, it could be like big toe, for instance. I don't know. You know what I mean? But you have a thing and you address most things correctly yeah, and it, it's like yeah. that that saved me that was just like oh my god now everything kind of makes more sense to me why i'm doing it you know what i mean well i think your brain like likes a little structure and you it fight does. it yeah <laughs> yeah for sure no i need i need it yeah yeah, yeah. And, and and you guys when you do your assessments um are you are you in a space that's uh, its own little room or are you still like in the gym the whole gym in the gym in yeah. the whole gym yeah Pretty well, and that's that's still okay. Like you can do that level of assessment and keep keep focus. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like I don't, personally, I don't like to do more than an hour. So uh, I I do um I do I can do the IMS two stuff all of it in about an hour and twenty I reckon. So yeah. I I usually just try and zip through that stuff, get the, get all that written down, and then that's why now I want to start. That's why I'm working with that girl and want to start offering bigger packages because I want to do that with stuff, the IMS3 stuff, and just cover everything in the assessment. Then I can yeah. really work on. But, ne- yeah, like you said, I never skip the IMS2. It's always thoroughly done. Mm. Yeah, And I think that's pretty great that you understand your limits there because if you keep pushing through, your client will feel that you're running out of steam and that's, you've yeah. gone past your best point. So good on you for knowing that. But most clients- people, like Huberman said, an hour and a half is what your brain can really handle, like, and and go hard for, and I th- I feel like that. Yeah, you know? and he goes ninety minute work intervals is optimal before you start to see a decline. decline. Yeah, and um, it's pretty spot on because I remember I was writing when I was writing the cleanse one day. I was I was like I was, I was on on the flow, and then I saw I was like getting to a point, and I was like, "What the fuck am I doing again?" This this, and I looked <laughs> at the clock because I put a clock on. It was like ninety two minutes. And I was like, "All right, time for a break," you know? <laughs> yeah. So I was yeah, like, it could just be a ten minute break or whatever, but just something that like breaks it up. Yeah, breaks it up. And I was like that with video editing. Eh? I was the worst. Like I'd be like hour and a half hard out, and then I'd be like off for a swim, then come back for another an hour and a half, and that was my full day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And Harry just fucking just goes. Eh? Yeah. Like well, he he's. Yeah, like he, it's like it. That's his. I don't know. It's yeah, his archetype or something. It, like yeah, that. yeah, it's like some people love it. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And and some people love to work all day, and they just they're passionate about it. Oh, I'm jealous of that because I don't have that. Mm. I'm like intense, short, intense bursts of learning, short, intense bursts of being working. You know, I don't want to do more than two hours. Mm. Yeah, productivity happens depending on it. Just you know, you you will level of productivity in your hour and something maybe as mm. much as someone else who spends you know four mm. hours. Um, yeah. <laughs> How cool is knowing you, that? Huh? Oh, how cool is knowing that? Like for individuality and people, like there is no rule book. You don't go sit in a classroom for eight hours a day. Some people, you know, they they praise people that sit in a classroom and 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 are smart for eight hours, but they're just kind of people that are academically smart like that and want to learn that way. However, there's people like us out there that just want to learn short and and intense ways, and we, everything's different. Like for and, every single person, yeah. And mm. good teachers will witness that. Yeah, and I think like yeah. you sort of broke up the class very well. Like, all right, now yeah. let's fucking do some prac. All right, let's do yeah, this. Yeah, like, true. You're true. not remembering shit now, you know. Otherwise, what's mm. the point? Um, instead of just talking, I, I got hungry or something. Did I get hungry? I needed coffee. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's good though. So it's a way to do it. It's a way to do it. Um, I want to touch on the body blade. On, on <laughs> oh yeah, I'm just going. I know I've got say. two. I've got two at my no, studio. They're Sick. hard to get. It's like what is it? it's like fucking gold. Yeah, eh? yeah. Um, and. Oh, they're so expensive too. It's oddly expensive what it is, but um, I've been using it a fair bit lately. I haven't, to be honest, used it with clients because they're never going to go get one. So I'm, I find it hard to give them something that they're only going to do once with me, and then you know what I mean. Like, and so okay, I, so let's, 
let's think about the body blade and talk about the body blade. So it's it's a it's a strip of what is it fibro? It's a uh, fiberglass. Yeah, and and you hold it in the middle, and it's got these two strips that run out, and and it it moves like wings flapping on an mm-hmm. on an airplane, I guess. Yeah. You can make a body blade out of a, a water bottle. You don't have to have a body blade. True. Yeah. Like just a, filling a water bottle up and holding it in the center of it and shaking it. Yeah. Now, it's not going to bend like this, but it's going to create a, a effect that makes you have to go from one direction to the other, which is what the body blade also is doing. Yeah. So right. you can you and, can totally create your own body blade. And when you give that to someone, are you sort of guiding them towards their weakness are you are you telling them to find like find find where it feels weak and then hold it there for till failure or what what are you choosing for that like um i'm still kind of thinking about fiber typing when i'm using that so i typically will do a 2a you know strength endurance re- response of what i want from it mm-hmm. um and it's more about rhythmic activation around the joint mm-hmm. if you're changing direction you're getting, you know, movement at the joint that's flexes, extensors, flex, and, and because you're trying to hold the joint stable, you're having to use the neutralizers on either side to activate as well. So now you're getting a, a, a big co-contraction around the joint. So I use it specifically for people to have joint instabilities. Mm-hmm. Uh, I love it for shoulders, but I use it for spines. Right. So, yeah, I'll get people lying on a Swiss ball, holding the body blade up, and they have to go like that, or they have to go like this. So what we're doing in my spine here is flexion extension. So I'm moving here. I'm moving like this. I'm training rotation. Far um, true. So, mm. Yeah, so you can do it standing. You can do it lying on a ball. You can do it lying on the floor. You can do one arm, two arm. You can do it while you're squatting. Yeah. Just, as they squat, they have to go over here with the blade and keep it moving. Is that to get it's those like creating- – deep spinal muscles as well that will that would get yeah. them hey so like getting the intrinsic um, spinal muscles to activate while you're on the swiss ball absolutely mm. and and doing it on the swiss ball where they're not up on against gravity may take away any pain from compression mm. so you put them down on a ball or on the floor and now you've taken away that pain element now hopefully the deep stabilizers will protectively switch on to hold the area against this force that's trying to pull them around mm. so and it's a short it's just short movement. It's not a long lever arm. Yeah, cool. What's and, and, mm-hmm. Oh, sorry. Yeah, like um, and because you know how sometimes if the joint's not centered, it'll create pain for the person. Yeah. Like say if commonly what I see is, and even on myself, that's why I see it, mm-hmm. <laughs> is like the rear capsule gets so tight, right, and it pushes the head of the humerus forward and then it feels like it's just the joint's just – gliding around like sometimes i'll like even say for a bench press or something and then you can get a lacrosse ball in your rear capsule and then it feels centered and then the, and then the exercise feels a lot better hence when we're talking about tissue work blending in as a tool with exercise that's an example yep. right there right yep. um why why do you think it's so common i'm like even if they don't have pain there that people are so limited in shoulder internal rotation from tight external rotators like do you see that as a i see it very often like a lot of people have a pretty limited internal rotation of their shoulders and they always have tight rear capsules. Like why? Why are we always seeing that? Okay, so the internal rotators of the shoulders, um, so tight internal rotation, so, which meaning that you, you're saying they've got l- limited internal rotation. Yeah, so so the external There's rotators a, are somewhat tight. Um, I probably see the opposite. Really? Fuck, I don't, I see, usually I can see people getting to 90 all the time on. Okay, so the the normal ranges, the normal ranges of external and internal are different anyway. You are, you're not, you don't have as much internal as you have external. Yeah, it's like 70 internal, 90 external, for my my knowledge anyway. Yeah, yes, but the different, what you talked about before with how the joint sits, it has a lot to do with how they'll manage rotation because if the, the axis of rotation is not aligned in the joint, then yeah. you're going to down-regulate. So, for example, if the shoulder's sitting funky, you'll always down-regulate the activation of the pec major and and probably the activation of the lats to a certain extent and maybe the activation of subscapularis. And they're all internal rotators. So do yeah. you have weakness because the position of the ball in the socket has shifted? Now the big muscles are being 
down-regulated. You'll never do a strong bench press if you've got an unstable shoulder mm. because the brain will always down-regulate the, the activation of the pec, pec major. Right. So um, it could be that, that rather than it being tightness, Carolyn, it might be more that there's weakness where the muscles have been down-regulated and they're not able to pull into that range of motion. Yeah, so the subscap could be weak and not supporting the front of the humerus. So yes. Yeah. Yeah. Or because the humerus has shifted forward, subscap gets turned down. Right, okay. And it's a, it's a stabilizer. You know, your rotator cuff is like the core in your spine. The rotator cuff, that to your shoulder. Mm. It's your deep stabilizing muscles. So. Yeah. I remember once right. you, you were telling us about the importance of, made me think about it because it's sort of like the glute meter of the shoulder, right, of the importance of the middle deltoid. Yeah. And and that you've seen from your experience. And you this is cool because, like, you don't – this is where you get clinical gems, right? Because you don't see anything – I haven't seen anything talk about middle deltoid out there on the internet too much, you know? But it's such a – when well, when I thought about it, it's the ball and socket joint. It's the middle of it, sort of like the glute meter of the hip, and it's the shoulder. And and so have you found just like – oh, and this is what I actually I forgot to ask you. How you put people in an internal rotation yeah. to, to isolate it. And why do you choose the internal rotation? Is it to hit, inhibit the posterior delt? Uh, inhibit the anterior deltoids. Put it in a short position as right. well. Okay. Right, okay. I mean, it depends on their pain as to whether you position. If they can get full internal rotation and then you go up, mm. that's the ideal. But you have to modify that pos- position because you don't want to be poking the angry bear and irritating yeah. it more. And more. So, um yeah, I, like the, the mid deltoid, its role is to stop the humerus from riding, riding up in the socket and therefore changing its normal alignment and control. So the mid deltoid is to pull that down. So if mid deltoid is weak, they keep getting impingement uh-huh. here and all over because the mid deltoid is not pulling the humerus down to, um, to wow. listen. And the supra, the supra, if the supra is long, the the humeral head will actually drop. It may do. It, it, it specifically that happens if um, the humerus is sort of hanging. If the if the scapula is tipped down and the humerus is hanging out of right, because the glenoid the sockets tip down as well, so the humerus is kind of hanging. Yeah. Then and if you had a tight out, tight yeah. um delta I mid mean, delt there, that would create that would create a mega pinch in that shoulder, wouldn't it? If you had that that two both of that going on. Yeah, it could do. It could do. It depends how far that shoulder's sitting low. So, the, the, yeah, the impingement issues are more to me a f- function of weak mid deltoid, um, and the yeah. other one is a function of an unstable shoulder that's literally hanging off the su- supraspinatus. Yeah. And so, so I'm trying to wrap my head around how the mid delt pulls the humerus down. I am, like, I I think about it pulling it up towards the acromion. So how how is that action happening? Sort of. You just said it pulls it up, did you? No, it, pulls, it, it helps it set it. it. Helps set it. Uh, just based on the fiber orientation from the deltoid tubercle to the where it attaches up on the acromion. Yeah. It's going as it contracts. It's going to pull it down. Oh. It oh, yeah, yeah, I see oh, what you mean. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's not, I think you're thinking it's shortened and pulling it up. Yeah, yeah, mm. I am. But, but it's almost really pushing it down, it. hey. The contraction is almost pushing it down, oh, isn't yeah, it? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, again, if I was thinking about that, I'd be like, well, yeah, you're right. It doesn't make sense. But apparently that's how it functions. <laughs> yeah. Well, now I, I know, but now now you t- twist it. Now it does make sense to me, hey, because yeah, yeah. that contraction almost, I guess the body of it would almost push the head push of the humerus down, down yeah. right? Because the humerus has to have a sort of inferior glide during arm elevation, hey. So so origin to insertion. So the insertion pulls it, will pull it. Anyway, I'm mm. sorry, I don't know that I can answer that mm. well. That's all right. Because <laughs> yeah. I've seen... Um, um, I was talking about it, it does feel like it would be the opposite, but apparently it's, that's not the case. Do you know who would, would give you the answer on that is Guy Boyer. Oh, right. Mm. Cool. We'll, call, um, we'll get him on the pod. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, because I've seen I've seen some pinching on the shoulder, and you can get short term. I don't know it's short term. How when you get a lacrosse ball in the delt, uh, in the delt, in the delt, <laughs> it it feels free for them. But I know I know it's short term. You know, um, yeah. where, where like so I wonder. Okay, why is that happening? Is it because it's pulling up into the 
I don't know. Well, maybe maybe if it's facilitated, it's faulty movement. It's creating a faulty movement. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if there is a, some sort of facilitation in there that's not allowing it to contract normally, or lengthen and contract. Yeah. Yeah. That, that could be what's driving that. Where um, you do need to to shut that down and sedate it, and then teach it how to work. Yeah. Again. Right. And, and also, you know, I think what we've got to really watch with shoulders is, it, you know, as soon as people l- move, they they have all sort of com- sort of compensations going on. So you've got to teach them how to lift that arm without the the clavicle and the scapula coming up, and mm. without up easiest contracting. You know, it's like you want to try to have them lifting that arm really purely and rotating really purely without this stuff going on, you know, people don't have that awareness of how to actually just move the humerus without anything else moving. Yeah, yeah, true. A lot of people have, with injuries have compensated patterns where they'll move the whole thing. Mm. Yeah, right. Wow, wow. Um, fuck yeah. yeah. Cool. <laughs> we, got, we got deep Yeah, in. I we feel like deep. it was just a mentorship call. Yeah. Like, <laughs> all these people are like, what the fuck are these people talking about? <laughs> <laughs> For the listeners out there, listen. Um, well, we've got to get you back out here again, Susie. When do you feel like a holiday? Oh, dude, any time I feel yeah. like a holiday. You know? <laughs> yeah, you love a holiday, yeah. Um, you got any courses lined up over here? So any Czech courses? Uh, yeah, there's a couple, but they're not till midway through the year. Okay, okay, cool. Yeah. Um, um, so I think that's like in the winter sometime we'll be heading over. Mm-hmm. Cool. Mm-hmm. That works for us. Works for us. Mm-hmm. That works we'll for see. us. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And is that in Sydney or Brisbane or? Uh, actually, that hasn't been confirmed. I think it's um, it, it was definitely Sydney, okay. but I, I wasn't sure about the other one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, cool. Um, and it, it might be it, here soon. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't know that. that would ta- be the best. They're talking about doing IMS. They're doing IMS four here, twenty uh, February twenty five. Yeah. <laughs> so you think they should want me to teach it? Yeah. <laughs> they cool. did. Eh? They wanted you to teach it. Eh? Because you're closer, but I think you said no, and then I think Matt's coming out. Uh, awesome. yeah, well. You know what? I watched, uh, I listened to uh, David Goggins on Herberman. Yeah. Oh, yeah, cool. How good's, how good's Goggins? Oh, my God. So I, um, I, I, I was like listening to that, and I just went, okay, it's that old saying, just feel the fear and do it. Mm. Like if you don't want to do it, you have to do it because of that, that stimulation of that anterior mid cingulate cortex in your brain that helps mm. drive well and that, that I found will grow or shrink, but it grows if you do something you don't want to do. And I was like, right then, I guess I need to teach that IMS for. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah again. Again, yeah, exactly. Cool. Yeah. I, I listened to the uh, Heaven's one the other day on cold and flus. Have you heard that one? Yes. Yeah, and how it, we, had, we had a chat about it, how I was talking about how vitamin C – like those large amounts of vitamin C, there's no real good evidence that it should really affect your cold and flus. And basically, like your food will be should be enough. And yeah. and um and we and Jake spoke to each other like, oh fuck, that's sort of makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, like having like all these thousand milligram pouches of vitamin C on the air every hour and all this sort of shit yeah. when I was sick. But like, um, basically, he just said like zinc was the main thing. Zinc, zinc. Yeah, he did. Yeah. yeah. So um, I do think, though, that when you, you know, you guys have a very amazing diet, mm. you're not going to need that vitamin C, but there's a lot of people out there that don't. Mm. And to boost vitamin C will make quite a difference. True. For them. Um, but maybe maybe all they also need is, is zinc. And maybe the vitamin C is all about the fact that they've got a shit diet as opposed to that they need vitamin yeah. C cold. They just need vitamin C to take the care, care of the, having a healthier body yeah. as opposed to, Yeah, you know. that's true. So, place. so how does someone uh, contact your clinic if they wanted to jump on your wait list? <laughs> uh, so um, I, although I'm changing my business name from Sweet 7, mm-hmm. that was S-W-E-T number 7, to um, Susie Neville, um, it's just not up yet. Mm-hmm. So at the moment, if anyone wants to reach out, it would be the email is info at sweet7.co.nz. Cool. Uh, eventually, it will be Susie Neville. Susie at suzyneville.nz. <laughs> yeah. Suzyneville.nz. Sick. And, and are you, are you, you're, um, well, you obviously mentor us. Is, is that something you want to go into more of, of, uh, yeah. sort of online Zoom sort of mentorship stuff? Oh. 
I love, and I want to say thank you for how you opened talking about the mentoring because that is that's my dream. That's what I'd love to do a lot more of. And I, and I've just been doing the art of manifesting through Mind Valley at the moment. I'm doing that course, and oh, no. um, and that's my one of my manifestations is that that I am coaching. Yeah, and you know, you know, doing like fifty fifty coaching and treatment. Yeah, wow. really keen to do more coaching. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's so. I mean, fuck. There's so many people that. I almost like want to keep it to ourselves. <laughs> yeah, you know, there's so many people that <laughs> listen to this right now. They'll definitely be hitting you up for that, eh? Like, yeah, because sure. it helped us. And if you are listen, it helped us so much. Yeah, so much. Like, yeah. Um, it's yeah. It's what it did is yeah. Just why are we giving someone exercise? Why does it make sense? Like, uh, constantly asking why, and really inspiring to know about anatomy. I think just the inspiration of that. I didn't. I didn't even know why I'd want to know it because I didn't think. Like it was never open to me that thought of thinking like that for some reason that this inserts there and and it pulls on that and it could change this and 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 then and then you step out from there and use the check model of like okay well now the thorax is is angled so don't worry about the shoulder stuff till that's there and and you know all these mm. little things and um it it all like you said it comes together with experience and and for the people listening like when I did IMS too like I I, I never felt ready. I never felt ready. I, I want to do another course, another course, another course. And then I realized it's just just over and over and over again. And then doing calls with you of like, why am, why is this, what does this assessment tell me? And then it just, yeah, it opens up a way of thinking yeah. that you just, it makes it fun. Yeah, it makes it fun. And it, it really uh, separates the people that are passionate from the people that are sort of not. Because the people that are passionate, they're going to love it and you'll see it in the energy and whatnot. Yeah. Um, and they're the ones that are always going to do well. Yeah. The so. fun is the fun is that it's a jigsaw. It's like this crazy puzzle, and you are, you're constantly having these really challenging puzzles that you have to complete and put together. And and I want you guys to know that you know Australia is really really low on people at the, your level of of skill. Mm-hmm. And you know even if I do do more coaching to other people, you will still always be leading because you've had time in the game. You've got expertise in IMS 1 and 2 and 3. And, you know, and you're getting expertise in IMS 4. I mean, you are leading your field here. Mm-hmm. And I just want to say congrats to get, for getting to this level and building your business and mm-hmm. doing what you're doing. And, and you're, you're getting these aha moments, Callum, because you've been doing it so much. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. You get to expert status. Yeah. This is what you're becoming. It's always in my yeah. head. It's always in my head. Yeah, for yeah. sure. And that yeah. Donald Newman book, fucking gold, hey? Like, <laughs> it's gold. It's absolutely so gold. The, so book of the, the book of the decade, yes. Yeah, yeah it's it is. Fucking a, nuts, eh? so it makes it, the, yeah, the diagrams and stuff was what I love the most. Like the drawings and stuff, it makes it so easy to understand. Yeah. And we said, like, I've got like a year ago, we're like, man, we got to get Susie out there to the world. Like, it's, <laughs> it's, it's oh, I feel like thanks. it's just it's it's necessary, you know what I mean? <laughs> um so we've gotta do we've got to do like next time you're here, we've got to do a course or, or something. We'll 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 come yeah, up we'll with do another cool. podcast in person and yeah. we'll do another like a Aldoa thing or whatever. Like I learned heaps from heaps from that Aldoa thing. I still use all those stretches with my clients and stuff. Yeah. I love it. So yeah. Appreciate it. Appreciate it heaps. Oh look, I really appreciate your wonderful kind words and yeah, I'm I'm a little bit of a technophobe, so I just rely on you guys to help put me out there. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, well, maybe that you listen to the Goggins, you might get get start talking to your camera and stuff, Instagram, start pumping shit. I know, I know. If I yeah. if I don't want to do it, I just I've got to go and do it. it was, mm. Yeah, yeah. You should if you I should just pick like it. pick like a subject like the shoulder and just talk about the shoulder to your camera uh, for like a minute and post it. Yeah, and just right. do one a day. Just pick one a day. Fuck, that'd be good. yeah. Like even with <laughs> someone else filming you with a shoulder or something. Yeah. Right? This is what I'm seeing, and it could be 20 second clips. Yeah, and, and it would just be right. gold. And then when we share it, you know, it just starts like that. Mm. Um, and when you're out here, we'll just get Harry just filming the shit out of you, and yeah. then that'll give you heaps. That'll give you heaps. Yeah, that'd be stuff. great. That's, that's an easy way. Do it when I'm not kind of like trying to do it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah exactly. exactly. That's the way. <laughs> yeah, it's natural. That's a good filmer. <laughs> yeah. All right, All right. Well, thanks, Susie. Thanks for coming on, and we'll we'll do it more. And I think next time, what I'm going to do because everyone will listen to this, and if you guys are listening, write in for us any questions that you could that you wish you could ask Susie. And the next time we we catch yeah, up, we'll, we'll ask it for you. Yeah. And don't forget, we got to say this now: like and subscribe, and and yeah. all the things, whatever you meant, whatever platform yeah, you're li- on. Like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Watch, listen to our podcast. We're growing, whether you like it or not. So just subscribe. Yeah, help us all out. <laughs> <laughs> It's right. worth it. We yeah. want we want more of you guys. It's yeah. awesome. Yeah, hell yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Susie. Love you.
Thank you. Love you. Bye. Bye. Bye.